welcome to the the 15th, the 17th of March version of, of our web seminars that the British School at Rome is running. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, and today we're going to talk about reframing the Italian Renaissance in the National Gallery. Uh, there are several different concepts all fighting their way against each other, not necessarily against each other here. Um, and we have two people in conversation, both of whom are experts in this. We have Peter Schader, who uh, has a, a training as a wood carver and has been working in frames in London since 1990. And he became head of framing at the National Gallery in 2005 and has reframed over 300 paintings of the permanent connection. And um, with him is speaking Harriet O'Neill, um, who, who is Assistant Director, Fine Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences here at the British School. Um, and is also a research associate uh, in Royal Holloway in London. Um, she did her doctorate uh, on reframing the Italian Renaissance in the National Gallery. Eight, uh, so you can see where the title of this paper came from. <laughs> Um, she was based in UCL and at the National Gallery itself. She's held curatorial positions at the gallery and at Royal Holloway before coming here. She's also worked as a frame specialist at Christie's and at Bonhams, and she's published articles on framing and frames, both literally and abstract. Uh, and so she's going to kick off, um, and then they're going to argue with her. We'll <laughs> Uh, and, no. and then, um, then, then after fifty minutes, we'll, we'll or so, uh, longer or shorter, depending on how how the argument's going, uh, we, we will we, we will have uh, questions and participation from all of the rest of you. Uh, so over to you, Harriet. You're starting. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I'm just uh, getting our presentation up. Thank you very much for the introduction, Chris. Um, and there. We go. Um, and thank you also to Peter for joining us from um, your office in the National Gallery. It's lovely to see it again and to see the frames in the background. And thank you for giving up your, your precious time. Um, I think uh, we're just to bring um, our listeners up to record or up to date um, and to kind of get them into the to, to the debate. Tonight, we're gonna to be thinking about, as Chris said, the reframing of Italian Renaissance altarpieces at the National Gallery. Um, reframing the Italian Renaissance seems a bit of a, a massive topic to deal with in 15 minutes. Um, we're gonna talk about the actions that uh, Peter and his colleagues have um, undertaken and their reframing and, um, uh, since 1995, um, in particular, in relation to the Italian Renaissance. Uh, altarpieces and look at the work of his predecessors, uh, focusing uh, quite a lot of our attention, I think, on 19th century neo-Renaissance frames, which uh, were key to my PhD. And I should say that actually for much of this, we're really lucky to have the National Archive and the National um, Gallery dossiers, which were um, a key part of my research when I was doing my PhD. And I think um, part of your method methodology, Peter, you know, you have the dossiers and, and the history of those frames. Yes, we have, we have got archives on, on every single, on every single paintings, how it was framed over the, over the time. Yeah, so yeah, so we have, yeah, we've got a kind of um, base to go back to. Um, I think we want to talk tonight and people are welcome to, to jump in and, and um, contribute to the debate and further it about um, the kind of changing role of frames um, in, the, in the sacred environment and how that role uh, and because particularly the conceptual role of frames and framing um, shifts when they, these altarpieces move into museums and galleries, specifically in the National Gallery. I think we also want to talk about the physical qualities of frames, the surfaces, types of objects, their materiality, and bring those debates together. Um, so I hope that's it. But symbolically, symbolically, it's sorry. So symbolically, it's very important to have. Or it's very interesting to have somebody speaking from Rome, where there are still paintings in their original context, and somebody speaking from London, where um, they have arrived in in in, in a. In, in, not, not usually not directly, usually via lots of other places and with lots of changes to their frames. And 
uh, their environments in general. So that's interesting to have both sort of endpoints, beginning and end in, in one talk. Mm. And um, yeah, we're going to come to the Euro Sebastiano example, which, okay, it wasn't in Rome, but very near Rome, in Viterbo. So I'm um, thinking about that transition as well. So it's a nice marrying up. Um, we decided to focus on um, the altarpiece frame um, because, and I'll show you, i just move on to the next slide, if I can. Um, oops. Uh, because um, in terms of the history of framing, they're really important. Um, category, the Italian Renaissance altarpiece is a really important category of Renaissance art, but the frame is an essential part of, of how they're constructed as an object. So the frame isn't just a border, but it actually forms what the object is. So I think that interests us both. It's also really interesting. Um, and I, I think either two photographs here, this is the National Gallery in 1923, with a number of the um, paintings and frames we're going to talk about on display in the barrier rooms. And here we have the Sainsbury ring, it's a different type of interior, um, shown fairly recently, again, with a with an altarpiece in the background, that Chima, um, the incredulity of St. Thomas. And Peter will be thinking possibly about how his frames work with those interiors. So very well chosen because they are pretty much the, the, the middle point of the gallery's existence on the on the left exactly a hundred years ago, more or less exactly a hundred years ago. And and now and I think we have got we will show later the Mackenzie watercolour of the very beginning of the National Gallery. So you have it like snapshots of, of interiors of the gallery in its various um, di different ways, diff different um, displays, different rooms. <laughs> Um, it's also really interesting um, to think about, sorry, the, um, it's an interesting time in the history of framing because it also, you move um, from the, the Trecento uh, polyptic, um, and that is interesting for me, particularly, to, and, and um, art historians, to think about um, the frame and the panel as one unit made at the same time. Um, and the difference it made when you move to the, the single field altarpiece parlour, where the frame could be made um, before, during, afterwards. And that's when you get the kind of the idea of a, of a more autonomous Renaissance frame. Um, and Peter particularly wanted to draw your attention to these two images. Oh, this is, a, <laughs> this you know, is in two on. images, the, the kind of entire history of, or the, the beginning of, of, of of um, Atlantica edicular frames, um, I'm. I don't think there's there's any any um, framing of a of a picture of some kind. In this case, a, a relief carving um, by Donatello. I don't think there's anything earlier than than than, than 1530s. So mm. 1535 is very very early in in, in this in, in 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 this in the introduction of of Atlantica framing whole frame elements. And, and Mantegna, I think, believe is the first um, painter who, who, who uses this type of frame. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the Zanzeno altarpiece in Verona is, 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 is fully developed in this style, but also I think one of the, at the very beginning of, of, of that development. And these type of frames actually change very little to, in, in, the, in, the, in the 16th century and um, sort of exist till, till about 1530. Not, not that, not, with not a huge amount of um, difference. Mm. And, and this, is, this is actually quite, quite uh, you can see how Mantegna uses the, 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 the space created by the frame um, inside the painting. There are later, and we will show one, of the, one or two of them, um, examples of frames that, that are even more incorporated into the into the into the painting, but this is already you couldn't ima really imagine the painting without the frame working in the same way. No, and we think that man that the, the painting came first and the frame came second. I think in relation to the <laughs> well. <laughs> That, that's certainly possible since 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 Mantegna doesn't really reference the very shape of the of 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 the columns or the or the capitals. He 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 seems to have painted 
so blank columns and capitals that face inwards towards <laughs> Madonna, and and then and then there's there are there's a, a clear distinction between our space, our our, our the, 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 the 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 real columns and the painted columns and the painted space. They kind of relate, but they're very separate, separate in style and and and, and, and not really interfering with each other. Um, and I think, yeah, so to think about space, I think we go on to the next slide. Um, on. Skipped one, right. So we return to Rome again. This is one of my favourite places. It's, the church is actually closed for restoration at the moment, but thinking about, um, you know, we looked at the Mantegna and actually the Donatello in isolation to their display context. Here, the, the Lippi the, in the Carafa Chapel is, you know, the, well, I should say that Santa Maria Sopra Minerva is one of the few remaining Gothic churches in Rome. Here we have an absolutely wonderful example of um, Renaissance Chapel. Lippi finished uh, the, the, the frescoes and the painting in about 1493. And in the centre, you see this Annunciation scene. The Cardinal, Cardinal Carafa, um, who commissioned it, had a particular devotion to um, Thomas Aquinas, who you can see in the right-hand side of the, um, of the altar. Um, but what I wanted to think about in this image is, is, is the working of the, of the fictive frames, um, and if you like, the real frames, um, in a, in in a kind of in the in the chapel environment because as we were talking pieces when we were preparing our slides there are sort of three layers of framing you have the the real stone frame if you like around the around the Annunciation then we have the the assumption of the Virgin above Saint Peter and Saint Paul on either side of of the Virgin and outside of this stone frame then you have the fictive frame again and then you have this kind of real archway. Um, which art historians think about, you know, the framing, these kind of physical and um, fictive elements mediating between the real world of the worshipper or viewer, um, and if you like, the, again, the fictive world um, that the painter is, 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 is conjuring for them, and that the frame it, frame is absolutely key to holding those two worlds together. And I wonder what, what you'd say to that, because we were also thinking about lighting conditions that you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell which frames were made of stone and which were painted. Clearly you couldn't be <laughs> archway, but... Especially for, for, for this illusion, the photography is actually um, intensifies the effect by, by, by really making it quite difficult to, to see that the small, the, the, the innermost frame is actually three-dimensional, but mm. the... the, the the um, the larger outer uh, pilasters and, and and capitals and the arch um, at the back is, is just illusionist painting and that but but that is actually very difficult to distinguish in the photograph um, and that I think is the intended effect completely that that, mm. that you get tricked into or, or the, the kind of the boundaries between between flat painted surface and Three-dimensional space of, of being challenged and 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 and, and in, in very and also in, in quite in quite amazing ways in that 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 the the central painted painting is kind of stand, freeze in a freestanding frame in the middle of a room held I think by by these um, ropes that that, mm. that that come down so 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 it even has a nod towards an actual functional, possible functional display that this this big stone painting and frame could actually be freestanding in the landscape. It's an extraordinary and, 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 and outlandish and, and, and quite wonderful uh, concept. Yeah, and sort of holds up this idea of this vision, which I imagine when you when you have these panels to think about and they come to the National Gallery, you've got to balance this sort of, you know, when you're reframing um, to think about how you how you convey that kind of the, the kind of the, the sacred and the and the visual, like these kind of apparition almost. Um, how much water? 
how much wonder has been lost in, in, the, in the transformation of artwork from their, their intended, especially uh, altarpieces, from their intended specific place. They were always made for really a very specific um, yes. um, place and visage um, in an environment. And uh, when once they come out of there and then without frame um, and via many other collections. And we have an example at next, I think, with where you can see that even more interference um, um, has, has, has happened to these paintings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ooh. We'll get there in the end. No. Yeah, OK, yeah. So we wanted to talk about the fragmentation. <laughs> Um, because this is the type of project um, and problem that Peter inherits and, you know, th his responsibility to the to the museum or gallery visitor. I feel it's quite weighty, really. So this is the um, an altarpiece, the Pessoa Santa Trinidad altarpiece that was started by Francesco Pesolino and finished by um, Filippo Lippi in workshop. So um, we managed to create the connection there. Um, it was broken up. The, um, it was um, during the po uh, yeah, basically the the church was. Um, I've completely forgotten the word. Um, Deconsecrated 1793. Um, so the these the individual the kind of this single parlor was cut up and the various parts um, ended up in different bits of the art market and in separate collections. And the National Gallery collected these parts, um, almost all of them, apart from this this bottom right hand corner. Um, uh, and, and put them back together and had enough of the parts by the 1930s to put them into a si single frame, which is based on a model in Santo Spirito in Florence. But what I wanted to highlight here is that, um, you know, the, 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 the need of the frame really um, to kind to make sense of these fragments, because there are institutions which would display these as single fragments, but the National Gallery tends to No. Hang on. Oh, sorry. Two seconds. Right. We have to do it like this. No. Peter, do you want to say anything while I figure out how to move the slide? Oh, I don't know yeah. why. <laughs> These type of frames are this this frame from the 1930s is very much in the tradition of 19th century frame making at the National Gallery, um, and and the National Gallery as an institution was one of the actually one of the first in the world that that that, that um, started making started putting Renaissance altarpiece paintings back into particular sort of architectural frames as early as the 1860s or from from the 1860s onwards. Um, and, and, and quite systematically, and probably about the, probably about thirty of these large altar pieces were were um, framed or were put back into into um, this type of frame. And these frames, um, quite interestingly, they, they, they kind of evoke an, a, 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 a Renaissance frame without being. I mean, this one is apparently, um, but no, but. Again, it's, it's actually as a copy, it's not, it doesn't, to, to anyone who knows something about frames, not for a moment would you, would, would, would you think that this is an old frame. This is quite mm -hmm. kind of obvious a reproduction frame. One would normally think possibly 19th century, but, but in this case, um, 1930s. Um, and they're not really exact copies of, of, of existing frames. Um, in the 19th century, even more so, they were, they were, and we will come to that in a moment, they, they, they were using pattern books and so patterns of ornament rather than um, actual frames to copy from. Have you worked out the. <laughs> no, we're almost there. Yep, we're there. Right, okay. moved. And um, yeah, so I wanted to draw the, the um, audience's attention to to this idea of fragments and how they're treated. So the, in the case of the Pesolino Lippi, uh, the National Gallery was in a position to collect all the pieces, almost all the pieces, and put them in one unifying frame, which conceals that sort of fragmented, you know, the history of the fragment. fragment. 
and the and the fragmentation process. But here are two examples um, where you know the the other parts of the altarpiece remain separate and in different collections, and so they're re they're reframed in these neo Renaissance style frames as individual artworks, if you like. Um, and uh, I think for me, what's particularly interesting is this, you know, the Francesco della Costa, we can see from the drawing, it's very, very faint, um, the drawing of Volandi on the bottom right, that, you know, it would have been surrounded by these Gothic style filials. Um, and yet the, the tendency in the 1850s, 1860s was putting it in these neo-Renaissance style frames and sort of, again, this, and what I'm interested in is, is what they're saying about um, these images by placing them in the Renaissance style frame, that they're making them Renaissance works of art and removing that Gothic aspect to it. And, and, and I would argue that both of those frames are not entirely successful, possibly the Tura frame is less, is less um, um, is possibly less destructive than the than the, the black background with with, with on, on on the on the Cossa frame and, and especially those um, the, the, um, the spandrels sort of plain gilded spandrels at the top which which really um, the frame looks very um, separate to the painting it really doesn't look in style or in in, in, in surface um, mm. as to be part of so it's, so they actually they are very much a museum display type of frame rather than a frame that tries to mediate between the viewer and the painter. Yes, and then when you put it in the gallery, back into the gallery space, again, it, it is not working towards the painting or, or the interior. It remains a sort of reference point, only it's, it's the frame referring to itself rather than relating to the composition. Whereas I think, as you say, for the tour, it's more successful. And, seems to at least pick up on some of the architectural aspects in the painting. Yeah, you, but I think an, a, a frame that, that would take more account of the, um, of the architecture could also be more successful for that. But it's, there's, there, the, these paintings are difficult to, to, to frame, especially Tura, which is such an extremely strange art. I mean, so it's mm. strange in its own use of architecture that, 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 that frames very easily clash. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got to see, think of these objects together. I think they're in the same room as well. They're, they're both connected to Ferrari's art or the Ferrari's school as well. So you've got to think about these frames operating together in the same space. And I guess that's why they went for a gallery style frame in the 1850s, 1860s, that you don't have to think about the frames themselves and these interiors competing against one another. Yeah, but also these are typical national gallery frames in that they are not copies of anything existing, frames mm. like that don't have any, any historical basis as frames. They just use sort of Renaissance style ornament. Right, we're, get, we're pushing ahead. We just need to work out this. No. Right, yes. And then we think about the fragments as well. So that here is the National Gallery displaying um, a set of images uh, without its frame. Um, I believe I have one in the 1850s and this was removed. Um, and it, it, this is something, obviously, <laughs> Peter, you're the head of framing, you put frames on, <laughs> you don't show images without their frames. But that, that is the actual decision of how, how things are framed um, is very much a curatorial decision. So, 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 so um, and there will be um, arguments for occasionally for the, most of our paintings are, are framed except for some fragments. Um, mm -hmm. Most paintings are framed in the gallery. Um, but there are um, sometimes, sometimes these 19th century frames are kind of hinder one from, from showing paintings in the, in the relation that they, that they just in terms of spacing in the relation that they want, were one space at and, 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 and then sometimes Paintings are shown without frames. I always think it's profoundly um, um, uh, dissatisfying to see paintings without frames because it, it it takes it makes them to my eye into more sort of anthropological um, objects rather than works of art. It takes the whole dimension 
um, especially mm -hmm. these early paintings, which would have been painted into existing frames. Therefore, mm -hmm. the artist, and with an easel painting, one could say, oh, the artist saw it without the frame, and then the frame was something that the collector put around the painting. But there, there's some argument for that, but these paintings would have been painted into existing, existing frames, probably into already gilded frames. So, so the relationship with, of frame and painting was very much fixed in the eye of the, mm -hmm. in the mind of the artist, and they were never intended to be seen without. Yeah, without those edges and the edges making sense of uh, in, uh, how you, uh, yeah, how the viewer or the worshipper understands the individual elements and is able to look at the individual elements and the whole. Almost you're, you're too struck here by, by the gaps in between. And, and even so, there's not much space sort of intended in the in the in the in the in, in, in these in these images so the space is important and without frames there's no space at all the the mm -hmm. the, the black the, the, the gold background sort of collapses forwards and 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 the the the, the saints almost slide off vertical surfaces mm. visually yeah no absolutely they need to be held together um, so we get make our way into the first manifestation of the National Gallery, which was in Angerstein's house. Um, it's um, a depiction from 1834, and we have um, the Sebastiana, which we're going to be returning to. Um, what for me is interesting is that you have um, frames here which um, are largely French in style, either French 18th century or copies of French um, 18th century frames. The dialogue is entirely with um, the, the ceiling ceiling ornament, um, and but, they, but, they, but these are frames that come out of even more kind of stylistically unified um, French 18th century interiors, where frames relate to the furniture, the 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 the, 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 the mantelpieces, to 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 to, to um, ornaments on mantelpieces. And 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 the frames were just completely part of a entirely um, homogenous uh, designed um, interior. But so many of our, our paintings came through French collections mm. to this country, to Britain, and therefore the the, the, the French eighteenth century frame was the old master frame yes. right up until the middle of the twentieth century. Do you have any Renaissance um, at the National Gallery? I'm trying to think. Are there any um, kind of 15th, 16th century um, Italian uh, paintings, panels in a Fr French 18th century frame still? Still? Yes, there are actually. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm just about to, to, to well, in 17th century. I can, mm -hmm. I can think of a 17th century French frame on a, on a Bronzino Madonna and Sharp that, I'm, that we are going to reframe. Okay. Soon. There tend to be more of the paintings that from the reserve collection. I think on the main floor, um, on sort of the main main paintings of the gallery that are always on the main floor. Um, I can't think of any. Mm -hmm. Because then I guess so. The the seventeenth century frame in that case is a commentary on the collect. You know the history of its collecting, and what you, when will you be making a sort of renaissance style for a sort of 16th century style frame for that one you know? we, we've got we've got a 16th century we've got an original 16th oh, century. okay and then you'll apply it to the okay so um we can talk about that afterwards okay but it, well, what was also interesting for this kind of interior so you can see that that what was quite common in in in, in the 16th century in italy um wooden frames of wooden and gilded frames those have been entirely removed for this kind of interior. You mm -hmm. could just about imagine an, uh, an Italian Baroque frame to, to have somehow survived this kind of treatment just because it might have just about fitted in. Um, but, but any uh, frame that wasn't gold would have certainly looked strange in this interior and been, and been, and been removed mm -hmm. by the time it came to the National Gallery. But, but, but the, 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 from my point of view or from the history of frames for interesting um, um, or fortuitous uh, um, about our gallery was that it, it did not come from one princely collection. Most European picture mm -hmm. galleries were part of a of 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 of, of, of a or, or derived from, from from historic collections with unified frames. Um, 
for the National Gallery because we didn't have a gallery frame at any point. No. It, it, it very early gave the opportunity to think about the frames and, and to reframe things historically appropriately or to, 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 to try to do that. So you talk about being a historically appropriate, and um, I think this quotation from Vargan, um, who was an um, art historian, but also the first director of the Gemälde Gallery, um, and advisor to uh, make recommendations uh, for display at the National Gallery when it moved to Trafalgar Square. And I think this probably encapsulates what would be seeing in your framing or approach to reframing, particularly of Italian Renaissance panels, and it's worth um, reading out that it's the duty of those entrusted with the arrangements of museums to lessen as much as possible the contrast which may necessarily exist between works of art in their original site and in their position in a museum and to realise to some degree the, the impression produced by a temple, church or palace or cabinet. And I guess we're kind of aiming for cabinet when we, um, aiming for church, we, live, we look at the altarpiece um, frames here. <laughs> yes. these, these are all examples of 19th century frames um, that the gallery produced between the 1860s and maybe 1890s. Actually, the, the Polyolo is a 1946 frame, but in that same, mm -hmm. um, in the same tradition of, yeah. of 19th century um, reproduction frame making. Yeah, and actually, so the, the two on the top, <clears throat> on the on the top half of the slide, were in that, um, were as as they are, <laughs> um, in the uh, interior view of the National Gallery in 1923, and we sort of thought about some of the characteristics of Renaissance frames, and it's that you know the ornament is, I think we can term it hyperlegible. Um, it's far more crisp and and readable or legible than um, a Renaissance frame would be. And that's partially also to do with the fact that it's oil gilding, not water gilding as well, I guess, which makes which makes the ornament far more, um, yeah, legible. There's a, there's, a, there's a greater hardness in the, in the, in the mm. exhibition. And I think that comes from um, the fact that they didn't have actual models of frames, but drawings of, 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 of patterns and in, in a drawing, a line that might be soft and in, 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 a ripple in origin becomes a, a defined sharp line and, and the person then instructed to make a frame to that design makes it much more defined than, 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 than the original would have been. Mm. And this is because, yes, <laughs> many of the examples are taken from stonework. Um, oh yes, we don't want, uh, yeah, we were just going to pass on to this actually, which is the Piero. We just wanted to say that it picks up on some of the things we're uh, the sort of the tendency to, to present these images, you know, the Piero at some point in the 1460s uh, would have been the central part of this altarpiece here, um, even though we think of it as a Renaissance, uh, as a Renaissance panel, but here it is in the National Gallery framed in the 1880s in a frame that makes it clearly seem like a Renaissance artwork. But it, but it is one of those really hard to imagine um, Original settings that 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 the the, the Piero of Francesca could have been surrounded by gold ground saints seems yes. very ambiguous and and I think especially as the the the, the Matteo Giovanni is slightly later than the Piero of Francesca mm. um, that that seems it also shows that there wasn't a, a single um, moment when when everybody just worked in, in Renaissance style it, it was it was it, it took it took um, or it, there was there was a um, a period when, when both stars were possible, and, and Matteo di Giovanni particularly um, painted paintings uh, in the same year as paintings in, with, in, put into Renaissance frames with um, Piero Francesca like uh, landscape backgrounds, as well as paintings on, on gold grounds until the, I think, until the 1470s, 1480s. So, so that's a, um, it's not a linear progression. No, um, and, and this is a particularly odd and hard to imagine. It's even hard to imagine for me what the frame might have looked like in the middle of these. Um, yes. Uh, in, in the middle, in the setting, it's, it seems. It seems. It seems. So I, 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 I can sympathise why, when I think it's possibly even the right decision to, to make a uh, to, to frame the, the single um, baptism of Christ in a Svarantica, uh, particular frame. Yeah. No, absolutely. 
No, absolutely. And, and that's what um, I was trying to get across in my PhD, that these frames are constructing what we understand to be a Renaissance image. Um, we're zooming forward. Um, we've got a lot to discuss. Um, uh, so uh, we were looking at the particularly these frames based on um, the, the, the portal of San Jobe. It seems in a way quite logical to build a Renaissance frame based on a doorway, it, you know, bringing together all the ideas of, the, you know, the frame being a window and, and that sort of thing. Um, significantly, it's an example of Tuscan Renaissance in Venice. Um, I tried to do some research about why they might have been so interested in San Jobe in the 1850s. There's certainly a ginormous um, photograph of the various decorative elements in the V&A. I think that kind of connects with the idea that these were, you know, that in the 19th century, in the 1850s, 1860s, they were interested in, in ornament and particularly beautiful ornament. But also because, because of the cat with that. Yes. With that. Skull, bovine skull with the, with a snake um, that, that is, goes through the skull that makes it very um, identifiable. Therefore, I think for other we don't haven't really identified all the sources for the other nineteenth century frames, but this one because of the skull it has been mm. has been identified. I think therefore uh, Saint Jobe has got a in our minds a very kind of important part of this and this design as as we as we'll see in the next slide as yes. as, as um, being used several times in the National Gallery. And probably we think of it as important because, it, they, you know, the San Giobbe frame type was used to frame very important altarpieces. pieces. So we have the Leonardo, the Raphael, and more problematically, I suppose, the Lorenzo Costa Manieri. Um, I think what interests me uh, when I was researching this and looking into this is that the from the guidebooks written written at the time in the 80 when when they collected 1880s 1890s they understood that these were very different types of water pieces they thought the leonardo leonardo is actually reflect um referred to as a triptych um with its two flanking side wings in the 1890 or 1892 edition of the national gallery guidebook the answer de madonna they understood would have had a um predella at the bottom which was which was missing and the costa there would have been a lunette of the pieta above it um so the 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 the, the, the san Giobbe type frame type kind of makes these into very similar types of objects which i guess had um clear advantages in terms of display yes yeah, so and, and 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 to have made these type of frames was a big step towards showing them as renaissance altarpieces compared to whatever frame they might have had which would probably um a, a, a narrow molding frame that would just hang on the wall rather than a, a frame mm. that would stand. These frames are, were made to stand on on plinth on a plinth, somewhat somewhat um, um, uh, representing an altar table. So, so so they were made into into much more um, very differently displayed uh, um, and more more and more difficult to display actually in a museum context where everything kind of has to have. A certain degree of mobility because because um, displays do change um, from time to time, and yeah. also it's, it, 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 it's interesting when you see these models how how the most unsuccessful parts are all the parts for which they didn't have models. Yes. So the the, the predella bases the the the, 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 the are, 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 are without ornament. It look it look very strange and disturbing, and and and, and likewise um, the spandrels. Uh, necessary for the Raphael and the Leonardo uh, yeah. are unornamented in, in their unornamented state. They're actually more interfering than, than, than if they were in some way motivated. Yeah. yeah. And actually, spandrels seem to be a problem, as we noted um, earlier when we were looking at the Francesco della Costa. Yeah. I also argued that it's, um, you know, they related to the, they were put in the Taylor extension, that was a new part of the National Gallery, um, and related very much to the, to the architectural ornament within that space and slightly also connected to constructing the Renaissance canon that, you know, Leonardo and Raphael were very much part of this accepted canon. It was more difficult when you spent public money to, um, you know, to insert Manieri into that debate. And, and, and of course, those, those Predella parts did have writing and I think still have writing underneath those grey um, coverings. Yes. So they did, have, they did say the title, the the the, the artist. So they, they were they were they were kind of functional 
um, um, in the gallery context. And, and, and at some point that concept was, was given up but made, made the frames look even less satisfactory. Yeah. And actually created a connection to the guidebook where people would be reading that this was a this was a triptych, this was a diptych, whatever. So no, that's interesting to think about the frame functioning in in relation to wider um, gallery ped pedagogy. Um, we we'll zoom on because we I want to really show you here um, that we here we have an original frame uh, around the Carlo Crivelli la Madonna delle Rondine. But as the conservation shows, um, 19th century hands got hold of it and very much altered the surface so that the, the blue parts are far deeper blue. Um, the right. <laughs> Black. They, they actually um, um, changed the blue to, to black. So it was, it was, it was, it was the ornament entirely regessoed and regilded on on black background, mm -hmm. um, and that was done to the only the only original surviving um, frame of this type that the gallery has um, yeah. ever had. So it became more, yeah. So it was sort of its Renaissance qualities were trumped up. So it became very much red as a as a neo Renaissance frame. Um, it was made to look like the nineteenth century frames. It was made to kind of fit into to that mm -hmm. look, and that was very much the policy of the gallery was to to um, um, bring everything up to a similar look, to, to kind of not mm -hmm. to not to have old looking original frames next to. Um, New reproduction of, of, of in, in, of in the style, of, um, yeah. And frames were sometimes regilded in Italy before they were sent to the gallery. Before the gallery expert had, had, had even looked at the frames, mm. it, was, it, was, it was there's a correspondence that that, that that says, "Oh, please, please regild and make make ready for for, for gallery display." Yes. So that was Probably because, yeah, the viewing public, um, you know, that actually these panels, uh, what, the, the Renaissance panels wasn't necessarily an accepted part of um, British taste at the time, you know, they were different types of work. So I guess they had to look as, as polished and ready for viewing as possible. And the framing was key to that presentation. The aim was simply not a, a, a display of kind of um, um, aiming at original, originality, no. but at a kind of um, if you want, in a kind of a context, but a museum style context. So um, I wondered, we're going to talk about um, two of your reframings, the Leonardo and um, <laughs> uh, and as Andrew Hopkins will be very pleased, I can see your questions, Andrew, uh, the Sebastiano. So I wondered whether you could say a little bit about, I know the Leonardo was reframed for the big Leonardo exhibition in 2000 and 10, 11? Um, not, not necessarily four, it just, it just happened to coincide actually. Coincide with it. it okay. Have, we would have not, um, I will talk with um, what we did in a moment. Um, we would have, but, but that was really just, just fortuitous that, that it worked out uh, in timing for, for the Leonardo exhibition. So we know that our painting once was in um, part of an altarpiece, um, like the one on the left in, in, in Fontaine Vitalina. Um, by and also in an older piece setting by by the by um, Giacomo de, de, de um, mm -hmm. so somewhat similar to 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 this surviving one, um, mm -hmm. and, and very different to the nineteenth century um, Saint Job of Brain. Yes. If you go so, to right, so, so did, did you find? I mean, were you dissatisfied? With the San Jobe frame, or was it a case that um, I just want to know kind of how your working process works? So you see, no, 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 I, I think I, I came across elements, parts of an, uh, really but, the remains of, 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 of an Al Antica uh, ridiculous frame, the pilasters and the entablature of an old frame. Yeah. Um, and I bought them, I, I found them at a general antiques auction, general, an auction of. Over two thousand lots and and amongst tables and sideboards and chairs and candlesticks, um, there were these amazing sort of elements of not a whole frame but parts of the frame um, of of something that that I've never seen um, for sale. Such sort of genuine, um, recognizable, uh, dateable quality, uh, and and we worked out very quickly that that the size was. 
possible for, 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 for the Leonardo. And the Leonardo was at the time in, in conservation. So that was a, um, something we um, thought we should attempt. So we, so we acquired the, the, the entablature and the, and the pilasters and then made up the rest of the frame, the, the predella and, and, the, um, and the spandrels in this case. Mm. Um, uh, and spandrels, but spandrels much more based on on the spandrels of the of, of the frame and content Marcellina. If we go back to the previous slide, we yep. can see that there. The, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, there are yeah. there are the yeah, there are spandrels actually with those big cabbage leaf designs. Um, yeah. No, I mean, so you have to trust me on that. So, no, so, no, I think uh, your spandrels are far more successful. <laughs> And the overall effect of, of, of uh, the original parts, the, the pilasters and the entablature, we left completely and un, un, very minor restoration, but really almost almost as good as no restoration at all, um, except for kind of completely missing uh, wooden elements. Um, but, but, but the overall effect of this frame with, of original elements and based on original designs is, is much more ornament than, than the 19th century frame you want in terms of volume, but 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 a much, much quieter ornamentation that allows um, all the, uh, it interferes much less with, with the composition of the painting. You can see how that kind of frame surrounds, but also creates a, a, a harmonious um, uh, surrounding for, 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 for a painting like this. And it's much, I mean, of course, it's not a recreation of the of, of the original polyptych, no. but, but, but it is uh, something that maybe Leonardo would have recognized as a frame. Yeah, and it, yeah, and it's yeah. Although it was a polyptych, it it's still it's presented in this. I don't know. We don't want to use these false distinctions, but I guess it is a Renaissance frame reflecting the Renaissance ornament in the um. The, that you were influenced by. When you bought the work, I mean, in terms of the public understanding of the frame, how how do you sort of signpost, or perhaps you don't even need to, that the frame mm -hmm. is I, I, made of part? It has been publicized, I think, even in the in the in the um, technical bulletin. Um, but 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 the, the, the to the to the um, we don't we don't really um, go into detail. Um, no. For the casual museum visitor, there, there is information for anyone who's interested, but but um, it's not it's not um, in the forefront. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's possibly something, but anyway, that's that's not that's not what we do at the moment. No, and I get. I mean, clearly they're two different photographs, but I think your frame does do something different to how we read the composition, and does I think work with the does bring out certain colours in in the painting. Yeah, it's always difficult. It's, 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 to, to, to really compare the effect of the frame and what we usually do when we, or what we often do when we suggest frames, we use the same image of the, of the painting and, 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 and transfer that into, and, into different frames. So that gives slightly more, but that's a, that's a difficult process. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's flawed. Even to just take a photograph of a frame painting is very difficult because, yes. because either like the painting, so that it looks right or the frame. The frame tends to look, uh, there tends to be too much light on the, on the frame when you, when you, when you take um, a photograph that's good for the picture and vice versa. So we're, we're speed on and you wanted me to include the Mantegna and believe that's, the frame. That's an important moment to show that, that, that um, as, as early or um, during the 1940s and, and, and the Filippendi, um, some very significant frame acquisitions were made, uh, acquisitions of, 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 of antique frames um, were made for the gallery. And this is, this is a, a, a fantastic frame that was bought from, from Pollard, which the, 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 also a very important himself as a frame dealer and maker. Um, this frame was acquired, I think, in 1946 and was replacing, and therefore, there we have a very bad photograph. Um, uh, a frame that I've since found out sometime in the 1920s, the Mantegna was taken out of a 19th century Atlantica frame mm -hmm. and out of, the, out of the, the glazing window was this very strange frame. Mm. Um, 
the flat frame um, created. And I've, even in this skewed um, juxtaposition, you can see that the, the real tabernacle, um, adicular frame, works so well with the, 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 the canopy about the Virgin, with the whole idea of the, of the painting it recreates a, 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 a pictorial space that works really well. Yes. Um, and it even has, so we're zooming in, but doesn't it even have references to the Virgin in, inscribed into the frame? Or am I get, getting that confused? It, I, I, yes, there is writing at the bottom, uh, sort of ornamental, but, but mm. I think even the writing. The frame is of, of fantastic quality. I, I, would, I would be um, hugely proud if I could find a frame like that for the National Gallery. Frames of this quality um, are almost not. Uh, not to my knowledge, on, uh, for sale anywhere. So, 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 so that was a really amazing yeah. acquisition for the gallery. And, and is and, it original size? Did it have to be adapted in any way, as far as you know? For it the... has been adapted, and, and, and not in the most elegant way, but okay. people are noticeable. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so let's we're returning to the Angersine um, interior, so we can talk about the Sebastiano. Um, yes, here it is. <laughs> That's the very large painting on the right, the, the, yes. the, the raising of Lazarus, yep. the Sebastiano de Piombo. And here, I mean, I think it's 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 very very rare that we know. I think all the frames that this painting has ever had, which is yes. which is really is, um, um, uh, exceptional for a painting that has gone through several frames. So what I think what this is, um, this is the Duke de Orleans, um, the, the frame from the Orleans collection. Um, mm -hmm. which must have uh, come over to the Angerstein um, collection because it, it, it just looks very much like, a, like an early 18th century frame. And then here put on this enormous sphinxes. I mean, it's, it's a, it is really also really, really strange to think that a big Renaissance altarpiece could have ever been in a, in a yeah. French interior center corner frame. It seems to be such a sort of clash of styles of, 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 of uh, artistic um, expressions. That, yeah. That really, really. Just um, highlighting that the concern wasn't to do with the, the composition and the painting or connective textualizing it in relation to the period no, in which it was made. Completely fitting great works of art of different periods into a unified design. Mm. Um, it, for me, it's, it's, we're going to see that it was being reframed multiple times. It's such an enormous, as we're seeing some of the images, it strikes me as, you know, it would almost be easier to leave it, but clearly people, framers, successive generations of framers at the National Gallery can't leave it because they can't find the, the right solution. So hopefully you have found a, a permanent solution. But here well, well, Not that many frames. I and mean, this is against... Strange that 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 in, 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 in that it wasn't. It's, it's one of the one of the few big altar big big altarpiece paintings that wasn't put into an altarpiece frame. Yeah, possibly as, as as you say because of its size and the and the, and the problems that that, that an, an altarpiece frame would would, would create for for for, for integrating it into a collection. But it was in, in the first instance it must have been taken out of the Orion frame and then put into a um, in, into a neoclassical frame, um, and, and to, uh, like, like a frame of, uh, of, for a Turner or, 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 or mm. sort of sort of eighteen twenties frame style. We don't know where that Orleans frame went. No, there, there's no trace of the Orleans. No frame. trace of no. Be nice to find. And then again, here we have it. Um, it's 1967 frame, which um, I always said to you, oh, it looks like it's, you know, it becomes a ceiling panel. And that's no accident because you 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 can tell us a little bit about the, the ornament it's within actually, the... Um, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a frame entirely made in 1967. It's a frame kind of reconstructed out of um, ceiling corners of, 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 of 16th century ceiling corners that was bought by the gallery or elements of the ceiling corners. You can, you can imagine um, this frame, it actually in the photography, it doesn't quite um, come across as, as three-dimensional, but it's really as, an, as like an L-shaped, sort of jutting outwards with these, with these, it is really, a, 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 because it is a ceiling corner, so it, is, it, it goes around like an L-bracket, um, and it would have been 
the, the, the ceiling for a small panel room mm. somewhere. In, uh, that, that, that's actually the origin, but it's a very, it's a very curious thing to use as a frame. It's a very, very inadequate. Very um, curious. Very inadequate uh, surround for, for a painting of, of such large scale to put a frame that is, that is so kind of, so pity and 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 mechanical in its in its in its um, in its rhythm. Mm. That really, in front with that with with that frame, um, the figures just become overly large. That you, you can almost not see past the enormous Christ and Lazarus, and 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 everything else just just becomes. Um, just there's no it doesn't help to order but it's a difficult scene um, um, mm. to see it the frame that we made and I think, yes um, i'm going on yeah so here we go <laughs> revealed well actually yeah not quite so here we have the um oh, you can tell us it's copy. Where, the, where the painting was painted for but when, when sebastiano sebastiano painted the painting um, um i think commission was was uh, was something like 1517 um Two paintings were commissioned by by, by the by, by by the Medici Cardinal of of Narbonne, um, one from Sebastiano and one from from Raphael. Raphael painted the Transfiguration now at the Vatican, and Sebastiano painted the Raising of Lazarus, which actually was sent to Narbonne. The, the Transfiguration never came to Narbonne, but the but the Lazarus came to Narbonne, um, where it was put in this chapel, but not in this framing device. The, the, when the when the when the um, uh, Duke d'Orléans bought the frame, uh, bought the painting from the from the cathedral in the early 18th century. He replaced it with a copy by Lamlo and a new 18th century setting. Yeah. And and, and what, what was just really wonderful from the from the sort of frame historian's point of view is that the predella. Which you can see in this yeah. photograph was was covered in the nineteenth in, in an eighteenth century panel, and discovered in the nineteen eighties as the original um, panel of the original um, Sebastiano painting by Christa Gardner von Teufel, and, and published by her as yeah. the discovery of the part of the original frame with the Medici uh, um, symbols here. Medici and Penza, and and um, yes, so quite 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 clearly part of the. Uh, and also of exactly the right size, and the, the the red circle shows you, which is slightly more difficult to envisage, but it shows you where a molding um, was attached that, that came towards us, um, so the three dimensional. So it shows that that it had three dimensional bases for for for, for columns going upwards. And so this type of I mean this type of predella in itself would suggest an ridiculous uh, uh, architectural frame, but with 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 that kind of um, um, mitered molding, you, you, you can um, say with absolute certainty that it was um, a frame with columns and and all the rest of within a tablature top, mm. which is what what we what we yes with that knowledge and that was kind of the first um, photo montage. To kind of envisage what one could do, and for, for, and for this sort of montage, I actually used the, the pilasters of the the Leonardo um, Madonna of the Rocks frame. So, so those those pilasters just hugely enlarged, and an entablature which I bought at the same auction in, in, in Genoa by chance. We came, uh, there were two interesting framing elements. There were those those which we used for the um, Madonna of the Rocks, and there was this enormous entablature. Um, which, which you can see in the, uh, on, on the left there, um, which was of the right scale. It wasn't quite the right size, but it was of the right kind of might that it, that it could uh, be used at the top. So we had we had we had certain knowledge of of, of what the predella looked like, and we had a possibility of a, of a, of, of, a, of an entablature of this of the right scale and of, of the right period. So mm. with those two um, elements in place, uh, I, I felt quite confident that, that, that um, we could attempt to, to recreate the frame. 
of, and then, of the scale. I think without, and then we, <laughs> and then we, um, we made the frame. Got um, cracking after, on there. After much discussion and with, with great, comp with great, great difficulties, we made the frame to start with as a temporary frame for the Sebastiano Michelangelo exhibition, which coincided with the 500th anniversary of the commission of the painting. So there was, the painting was a, was a highlight of the exhibition. And because of this sort of significant date, um, we thought an attempt to, to recreate the original frame um, it, it seemed a, a timely um, moment to, to, to attempt that. Um, and it was really, in the first instance, made as a frame for the exhibition. Okay. And you can see we, 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 had, we, we carved a, a, a full scale copies of the pieces that needed to be copied and we enlarged the entire piece by about yeah. a meter in width. Okay, um, yeah, so you can see, so, yeah, so you can see here that you were pushing forward, pushing, make, it yeah. Was it was actually cut in that way. It, wasn't, it was too huge for whoever um, had it. I think, I think the, the option also it came from a, from, from a, from a restorer's, um, uh, um, store uh, mm -hmm. and, and just to store the, 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 this really big piece, they just cut it. Oh, I see. Ah, uh, okay. We, we use that cut to enlarge, to make them, to bring them back to, to, to the original usage. And this is, again, this is not, I think this is not an actual photograph. This no, it's your photo montage. Yeah. Montage. This, here we go. <laughs> scale but do go back because because yeah. because I, one can sort of show first of all i think the frame really contains now contains these large figures and makes it makes makes the composition much more legible it creates a much greater sense of space at, at, at the top and 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 it, it sort of chimes and rhythm with the with the um with the busyness of the paintings you have, you have the less ornamented mm -hmm. bases of, of the columns framing the part of the, the painting that is without any heads and, and the calmest parts. And then you have the really busy parts of the, of, 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 of the columns framing all the heads. And I think um, Sebastiano writes that he paints 40 heads. Um, he's very proud of the number of heads painted. Um, um, but but all, these, all this kind of really busy and complicated ornament is, is, is uh, complicated um, design of the painting is, is, is is um, surrounded by a busy ornament, and 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 at the top, for the sky and the kind of distance, you have the you have the you have the, uh, the capital. So 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 it it, it does in, in just in the rhythm of 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 on its scale, it, it, it chimes with the painting, and I think it has made the painting into a much more of a of a um, and you can go to the next picture for that into much more of a focus in the gallery. Yes. I, I would, I, I think people used to go past it and it wasn't, it wasn't um, a focal point for the gallery, but this is after all, it's NG1. It's the you can't miss it, no. It was given number one, I think, as a statement when it was bought, um, because it was bought amongst a group of paintings. Um, and I think this was given number one to, 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 um, show the ambition that the gallery had to, to, to acquire mm. large paintings by important masters. And mm. I think in this frame, it really looks like it. It does. And it's hard, it's easier it to see it. I think, you know, when it was in the ceiling frame or ceiling corners frame, I, I don't know, it's, it became, yeah, as you say, very difficult to read. This kind of sort of grounds it in a way. Well, there, there were arguments against this frame in that, that, in that it would make it more difficult to hang out the paintings next to it. But I think the a painting of that scale makes it difficult to hang smaller pictures yeah. next to it anyway. So no, it's, in a funny way. The frame helps to separate it in, in a way that actually makes it more possible to hang paintings next to it, I would argue. Well, let's, um, we're going to zoom up, it's seven o'clock, so we want time for questions, oh, five past seven, so um, we just, we uh, go quickly um, through the rest of the slides, but um, really we wanted to show this Sebastiano, so it's in, in, in the table, as we, we mentioned, and, and, you know, we were talking about this white frame here, you know, that it, the image almost wants to float off, and this is your frame. I, I, 
I think what is interesting about this, um, um, showing these two versions, which is just the same painting, that, which was which was lent to the National Gallery for the Sebastian Michelangelo exhibition on the right, and for which I, I made a frame, temporary frame for the exhibition. This one was really, but there is, <laughs> there is actually the original frame has survived in the Cabo in the church that was heavily bombed. And, and this is a walnut version of parts of, 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 okay. of the surviving original. So, so it is somewhat based on, on, on the scale of the original frame a little bit. But, it, but, it, but for me, this showing these side by side shows that there is always an, there is an argument to once you've lost the original frame, should, wouldn't it be better to show it in a neutral, um, mm -hmm. in a neutral way, like the white frame and sort of obviously new frame so, so that, you, that the visitor can see the painting or the or that's original of the painting without something that blurs the boundary. But yes. I find the painting so much more legible in, mm -hmm. in, in the frame on the right. The, 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 the edges become so much more visible in, in a frame that is that is a, As you in some kind of harmony and scale yeah. and, and color to the painting. But the white sort of hard edge. And, and in this case, even the shadow. I mean, the lighting is, is, is similar of similar quality. We also have direct um, uh, uh, light, direct light, light, um, which usually creates a shadow, but the frame on the right doesn't create a shadow. So you can actually see the moon above the Virgin, mm. right on the left, it is, it is obscured in, 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 that, in that big wide rim. But, all, but not only that, everything around the edge becomes very hard to see, very hard to get a pictorial impression of it. Whereas yeah. the, right, the frame on the right aids one to see the painting um, and actually draws less attention to the, to the, to the frame than, than this so-called neutral border on the left. Yes, I know for neutral border and, and I think the white, I suppose it's made to, to, to kind of work with Christ. When this is a particularly, uh, it was a particularly um, unpleasant or, or, or unsuccessful example where, 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 where it really looks like it. You've chosen the worst one, Peter. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I understand. I'm, go I'm going to skip, we had two more slides. We basically wanted to show you um, kind of uh, to end, I, I suppose. Thank you. Because that's, that's the last one is interesting. Yeah. Yes, so this is the these uh, the, the the remaining frame for Bellini's San Giove altarpiece, um, which, as you can see, has been filled. Let's go back there. So you, it's been filled with a eighteenth uh, century painting nice. there. But um, here we have um, how it's shown in the Academia, and this is yes. the photo montage of how it would have looked. And, and and you can see how the painting is is becomes a completely different. Um, how, how, how the frame in this case is completely part of the painting. It, 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 it is, it is uh, to my mind, the most complete um, or in, in attention, the most complete unity of frame and, and, mm. and, and painting of the time because Bellini actually paints the very pilasters in, com in, 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 in yes. with great accuracy. And, yes. and, 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 and the, the coffered ceiling also continues from frame into painting. And I think it comes from the from this particular space, it is it is a church. San Giovanni is a church which has real three-dimensional chapels on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. It doesn't have the space for the chapels, and therefore, I think it was it was it was sensible to create a pictorial space that is as real as possible um, yes. to balance the, the, the chapels on the other side. And and to my mind, the, the, this painting without its frame becomes a fragment because you can't really see how I mean the, the, the entire coffered ceiling and 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 the, the gilded dome um, the gilded dome are, are really flattened by, by by the absence of the frame it, 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 and it was never it was never intended to and, and the figures and everything becomes becomes a, a very different and very um, lost work of art. And, yeah. And, and, and absolutely, and it goes, returns us to what we were trying to say with the Lippi and Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, you know, about the, 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 the worshipper, the viewer being able to imaginatively enter the scene and the frame mediating between 
the real and fictive worlds. And I think here, as you say, it's just an exemplary example of, of that. Yeah. Um, no, carry on. No, no, that's, that's a good, that's a good painting to finish on because that <laughs> yeah. is, that is the kind of effect one wants to avoid the, 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 on the left and the, the, the kind of um, in the, the image or the kind of depth one, one wants to create. Um, it's much more difficult or it's more difficult if you don't know what, what the frame would have looked like. But in this case, we know exactly and we can see what a great difference it makes mm. in the montage. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Peace. Thank you for talking to me. I can see that there's some questions. So I let yeah. uh, welcome Chris back in and let him um, start making sense of them. But thank you very much, Peace.